As China's top legislature deliberates for a proposed national security law for Hong Kong, the city is back in the spotlight. In the second episode of our series, Voices on Hong Kong, I speak to Annie Usuk Ching, a Hong Kong entrepreneur and a supervising advisor of the Hong Kong Federation of Women. And the COVID-19 pandemic, is it the cause or the catalyst to worsening U.S.-China ties? I will speak exclusively to renowned U.K. scholar Martin Jakes. Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. Ambition. At a weekly press conference on Tuesday, the Hong Kong SAR chief executive Carrie Lam dismissed points made by overseas politicians concerning the national security law proposed by China's top legislature. She assured that the proposed law would not hurt the city's rights and freedoms. She also said those concerned need to wait for the details of the proposed legislation. Will the new law undermine freedoms and rights of the people of Hong Kong or even undermine the Hong Kong's position as an international financial hub. In the second episode of our series, Voices on Hong Kong, I spoke to Annie Wu-Suk Ching, a Hong Kong entrepreneur and supervising advisor of the Hong Kong Federation of Women. From 2003 to 2018, she served as a member of the Standing Committee of the Chinese Political Consultative Conference, the country's top political advisory body. I started by asking Annie Wu about uh, the level of public support for this legislation? I think when we talk about the general public, we have different types of general public in Hong Kong. The average person on the street, we like to have law and order because we have gone through so much violence and riots. So if the national security law is enacted, then we at least have law and order that give us a chance to do business properly. So this is the general public. But on the other hand, the young people, they don't see the national security law as uh, as the same as the general public. They think this is really a chance that they, they want to upstage Hong Kong and they don't want to have Hong Kong under the control of central government. So this is the young people's concept. And certain professional people, they also don't want to have the national security law because they think this is the usurp of the one country, two system. So we have different opinions from different types of people in Hong Kong. Mm. But how divided is public opinion? I mean, I understand there are a lot of people, you, I suppose, uh, as one of them, who want to see law and order returning to the society of Hong Kong. But you talked about this, this group of uh, young people and some professionals. But how big of a percentage do they occupy in the Hong Kong society? And how important uh, are their voices to be heard and to be taken into consideration? Well, I don't have the uh, census or the calculation of the young people, but I feel the majority of the young people, especially the uh, secondary school students, the upper levels, and also the university students, and young people are really in the working society, felt that they are being um, hampered with the new law. Of course, this is because they have no idea of uh, Hong Kong return to China since 1997. We have never thought about uh, what we call the uh, patriotism or the identity of a national identity in Hong Kong for the last 23 years. So they have been misguided and misinformed. But the general public who are the working people, who are, I will use the, um, the blue collar workers, and the average person working in Hong Kong, they are very much in favor of law and order. So I still think this will be the majority of the population in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I mention about certain uh, professional bodies, like people in the legal profession or people in the social working field, they are, they are looking at the law in a different perspective. So they are still representing the minority in Hong Kong. So it is true that there are different voices. Um, do you think it is necessary and it is practical practicable for this law to be enacted in Beijing and implemented on the ground in Hong Kong. How much opposition do you think it might really encounter? Um, for the general public, uh, the law should be enacted in Hong Kong the sooner the better. So we can have law and order, we can have the police uh, to really calm down all the riots and disturbances and violence. Uh, in the meantime, as a person living in Hong Kong, I expect a lot more violence and reaction to the law instigated by young people who have been misguided by certain uh, 
I would use the word anti-Chinese um, bodies in Hong Kong, who may be also working together with forces from outside of Hong Kong, from other countries, who wanted to disturb the um, uh, security of Hong Kong, and also to be anti-China, anti-Beijing. So I don't think Hong Kong will be going through what we call um, calm for, uh, peace and calm for the next six months or maybe even one year. But we still have to go through the turbulent times in order to achieve law and order and security for Hong Kong in the long run. So this is a necessity. How much of a necessity would you describe? How would you call it this national legislation by the National People's Congress? Uh, because uh, 20, they waited, the central government in Beijing literally waited 23 years uh, for Hong Kong to enact this law on its own as uh, stipulated by the basic law in Hong Kong and yet uh, with no avail by now. So how would you describe this legislation, this, this extraordinary step taken by Beijing? Well, since 1997, 1st of July, uh, central government has given us a lot of time to give Hong Kong the high degree of autonomy. So under the one country, two system, we have enjoyed a lot of benefits uh, for the last 23 years. But if you can recall back in 2003, the first chief executive, Mr. Tong Chi Wan, tried to uh, introduce the Article 23. And that was also uh, being met by a peaceful demonstration. So Mr. Tong took down the Article 23. And then since then, we have a lot of disturbances in our legislative council. Mm -hmm. And the whole system of the rule and law and law and law and order in Hong Kong, the rule of law, has been very much been, uh, I would say, being dis distorted. And uh, since the 2003, we have the uh, umbrella, uh, I, I would say, uprising and other activities coming on. So it's going from bad to worse. And if central government does not help Hong Kong to restore our law and order now. I think Hong Kong is going down the drain very quickly. So it is very important that central government now should back up the Hong Kong SAR government. We should introduce anything, the sooner the better, and not to waste time. Um, I'm going to ask you this question from the perspective of um, people who have been um, disadvantaged in terms of uh, job opportunity, uh, upward mobility. I mean, Annie, you have uh, a rather successful business career and uh, you actually run a, a quite a successful enterprise um, and your business of course was uh, severely damaged during the unrest last year so it is understandable that you want to see law and order uh, put back in place in the society on the streets of Hong Kong and yet for those young people who um, for whatever reason see little hope in fulfilling their dreams in developing themselves and having a stable job and having housing and so on and so forth uh, shouldn't their concerns be taken into consideration shouldn't there be more uh, dialogue and and more time more sh patience before a a strong move taken from beijing and uh, which would have very severe consequences on on the on the future of some of them uh, I feel the education in Hong Kong for the last 23 years, we have not taught the young people that Hong Kong is part of China. The education system, all the textbooks we have learned is we only talk about Hong Kong. We never talk about China. And so the young people has a very wrong perception that we should maintain Hong Kong as Hong Kong. We are people in Hong Kong. We are not Chinese. So that has been in, um, penetrated into their mind for so many years. So we have two generations, our teachers and young people, they do not think they are part of China. They think Hong Kong should be independent. And this is a very dangerous uh, mindset. And more so because they have been interested and also been influenced by Western ideology of what we call human rights and also uh, freedom of speech, which in Hong Kong we have been abused because a small minority of people have used the freedom of right and also freedom of speech to try to dis destroy uh, public, uh, uh, I would say, uh, services and uh, breaking the law. And they are uh, creating a lot of violence, which no other countries, I think, would allow this to happen. And Hong Kong, we should not allow any more disturbances. And the young people, because they have been, I, use, I will use the word brainwashed, through social media, through education in the school, 
by the teachers, they cannot recognize that when you want to have a, a peaceful um, um, not demonstration, they are the alternative to violence. And this is very important to maintain law and order in Hong Kong. We, we welcome peaceful demonstration. We welcome people to have the right to speech. But now, a lot of the younger people are destroying others, uh, the average person, the voice of speaking. And that's why we don't have the freedom of speech anymore. And we need to preserve the freedom of speech and the right to speak for the majority, not only for the minority. So you talk a lot about uh, the education uh, setback or shortcoming in the system in Hong Kong. Shouldn't that be the priority then for the central government or for the local government to pay attention to, to correct or to fill in the holes in the education about their, their identity as a Chinese instead of pushing forward such a law? Uh, we have wasted 23 years of not um, giving the young people a chance of understanding they are Chinese. So this is a long-term uh, work process. We can't do it in about a year or two years because the present young people, uh, they have been really been, uh, I, uh, been brainwashed in such a way that they cannot accept other people's uh, comments. So if you are not thinking along the same as they are, they would say you are on the opposite side, you are the enemies. Um, also, some people in the religious bodies are also helping us to brainwash the young people. So this will be a long-term work that we need to do at once without any dis uh, delay. Oh. But in a, in a short time, we need to put in the le yeah. national security legislation and the law to but protect a, Hong Kong, the every citizen. Yeah. It's rather a strong dose, however, but uh, I guess your point is that it's, it's against a very severe situation, so a strong dose is probably necessary. Uh, on the other hand, uh, how do you ensure how can you alleviate people, or how can the central government um, alleviate the concern of those for Hong Kong being still a very free society, a very free port city, uh, an international financial hub? Will this legislation in any way impede on Hong Kong's uh, advantages in those regards? A lot of my friends who are foreigners live in Hong Kong, they are non Chinese. They felt very sorry to see Hong Kong is being disturbed by all this violence and riot. And they did not want to leave Hong Kong. And they said, well, they want to come back to work in Hong Kong if the riots and the violence are being, I would say, contained. So the foreigners really appreciate Hong Kong as the place for, uh, let's say, their society, for free business. I don't think Hong Kong will be affected in terms of the center for financial hub, a center for uh, free enterprise. Rather, if we don't contain the violence and rise through the national security legislation, foreign businesses will not dare to come back to Hong Kong because they fear that the business will not be protected. Um, this is the most uh, critical part and the timing to put Hong Kong back into the, in the right track to maintain Hong Kong as a free port for business, to, con to really calm down the foreign investors to come to Hong Kong. How do you look at the concern of uh quite some people representing quite um, a, a, you know, widespread point of view thinking that really Hong Kong's special status or Hong Kong's freedom or the two systems will be endangered. As there are some people who talk about the end of Hong Kong. Uh, any sitting in Hong Kong, living in Hong Kong and looking at all of that, um, do you think they get the point? Or do you think to a certain degree their concern um, should be taken into consideration depending on how this law is implemented on the ground? What is your view? I understand there have been certain um, overseas uh, politicians, I use the word politicians, to make certain statements criticizing Hong Kong. But we never heard from the business sectors criticizing Hong Kong. And why? Because the business sector foreign business sector still think Hong Kong is the best place to do business, to set up the headquarters in Asia. And they use Hong Kong because they feel this is the place that they can have free flow of capital and they can have rest safety in the uh, putting the um, uh, money into the bank. And Hong Kong has a very good sense of rule of law. And we have a very good system for all the companies to list, listed in Hong Kong. So you don't have non-politicians that criticizing Hong Kong. 
these are only politicians who are trying to show that they're supporting the, the young people or supporting certain vested interests to criticize Hong Kong. So I feel it is very important that the business sector and those other international MNC, multinational companies, to see the value of Hong Kong. Mm. Finally, and we appreciate Annie, your place. Yeah, fin finally, Annie, do you, how do you see the development of the situation? Right now, we are seeing an upsurge of violence in Hong Kong with the, the uh, the progress of this legislation. How do you foresee things developing, and uh, does it have? How bad does it have to get before it can start to get better? This is only my personal guess. Um, I think for the next few months will be very critical because we are supposed to have a election for the legislative council. We have other ongoing, um, maybe the candidacy for the election of the chief executive for next year. So I feel still the minority uh, who are really anti-Beijing, anti-Hong Kong, they may start, still try to work with foreign um, vested interests and may have certain funds from foreign uh, interest agencies to do a lot of um, violence, uh, great violence in Hong, arise in Hong Kong. So I need to see that our police uh, commissioner, together with the chief executive of the SAR, together with the support of central government, to um, put down all these riots and violence and put Hong Kong back into order. But I think this may take, at least my personal guess, maybe six months or maybe nine months, I don't know. Let's hope that the, there won't be too much violence on the streets of Hong Kong. There's been indeed a lot, even too much already. Many thanks to Annie Wu joining us from Hong Kong.